Welcome to Discussions with the Writer Fred right here at Black Video Network in San Antonio, Texas. And we are the voice for the black community here in San Antonio, Texas. Today I have a special guest uh, who is really knowledgeable in the world of sports. I have Rod Tanner and but close to friends, he's known as Rod Chico Tanner. That's correct. Though. And he is the governor for the South Texas AAU. He has a podcast called The Tanner Report, and he also has a show on ESPN San Antonio called Laying Down the Law. So welcome, Rod, to Discussions with the Writer Fred. Fred, pleasure to be here and uh, glad to uh, be a part of what's going on with your show and, okay. and with the community here in San Antonio, being a native. Oh, okay. Uh, tell my viewers a little about, about you. So, um, Rod Tanner, my government name, well, friends and family call me Chico, long time family nickname that uh, got from my father back when he was in the military and stationed over in, in uh, Japan, actually, a friend of his, and he, uh, they had this thing going on. So that transcended uh, from the age of about three or four, and then um, that just stuck with me. I've, I've tried to kind of get rid of it, but it, 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 it was impossible. So <laughs> I've had to kind of ride with it, if okay. you will. Um, but um, I've been involved with uh, sports since I was a kid. Um, and AAU has been a big part of my life. Mm -hmm. uh, so was able to uh, garner um, some time in the volunteer side of it. And, and over the time and period, uh, have become part of the executive committee for the South Texas district of the AAU, which pretty much governs just about Waco down to Brownsville wow, okay. from Corpus Christi over to Del Rio. Okay. So a pretty big geographic area we govern. Right. And, and that's all the sports within the AAU umbrella. So uh, basketball, track and field, swimming, diving, football, cheer, um, volleyball, a lot of different sports that fall up under that umbrella. Mm -hmm. And we fall up under the national umbrella of the AAU, AAU okay. which is the Amateur Athletic Union. For those who are not familiar, the AAU was founded in 1888. Really? Wow. The AAU is what today we know in, in many different realms, but it was the foundation of what parks and recs and communities were. And then the Amateur Athletic Union was also the governing body for the Olympic um, committee for the U.S. for many, many years. Okay. Then there was a separation between the Olympic Committee of the U.S. and okay. AAU. AAU supports over 600,000 athletes across the U.S. and and some 150,000 coaches and volunteers. Okay. So that that's the big umbrella of AAU. Uh, okay. So what are you all doing right now? Are you in the football or what sport are you into? So right now, and I actually help run, football is going on right now. Our Texas AAU Football League is in its going into our fourth week already. Mm -hmm. um, there's a national footprint for AAU football and for what we call recreational football cheer, which we have competitions for the cheer and football on the local and national level. Um, there are other sports going on as well. In December, we'll be in Knoxville, uh, Tennessee for our cross-country nationals. There's AAU wrestling going on. AAU hockey will be kicking off soon. A lot of different other sports going on across the spectrum of AAU. And what's the age? Uh, well, the AAU ages. really runs from just about 5 to 18. Really? Yeah. And so if a parent wanted to get their child involved in AAU, how would they do that? You can go to aausports.org. Mm -hmm. and, and there's actually a, a mechanism on the website, aausports.org, to find a team or find a program. Mm -hmm. And it actually says, find a club, find okay. a program. Or you can actually look at some of the drop-down menus and look for the particular sport. And there's contacts there, contact information, emails, numbers, where you can contact and they can point you to your local representative with okay. across the nation um, that AAU supports. So if I had a child and I wanted them to get involved in, let's say, basketball, they would they'd go through that process? They can go through that process, and then they would give them a list of potential clubs in the area, okay. and then the parent would contact the club mm -hmm. and, and see if that club is a fit for, for their child. And when you say fit, how, how do you define that? Fit well, in what I mean, way? Each, each parent is going to look at a, a program to see what the coaching is like, what the environment is like, what the culture is like. Um, it's a little different than, than a recreational where you just sign your kid up uh -huh. and they place your kid on the team. Okay. Now there are some leagues out there that, that are, may have an AAU foundation. Um, for basketball, not so much. Basketball is very much a club sport and it's very much where clubs go and play in different tournaments. 
they may put their AAU program into a league, mm -hmm. but you definitely are looking for what's a good fit. Um, there's a lot of things that go into play in there. Um, you know, is that club really focused on just younger developmental um, kids? Are they more for mid-level? Are they more for advanced level? Um, where are they located? Because okay. ge geography is everything. You may live in one area. That <laughs> club that you like may be, in you know, an, an hour and a half away every day. But can you still go to that club? You could, if yes. If you want to. Yes, um, yeah, if you had the time and, and the energy. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Well, okay, what happens, one, one of the things that I've always been concerned about is for young kids, competition. And you, you're going to have some kids that are more competitive and better than the other kids. What happens to that child that comes to you all and doesn't have, maybe he can't make a jump shot or he's slow? And how do you deal with that, with that so, kind of now, kid? Personally, depending on what, what when I was coaching, because I coached in AAU for a long time, and, and a lot of mine was around track and field, because uh -huh. I do a lot, I'm the director for track and field for this area. And when you look at each sport, you have to take it different. Okay. Um, certain sports have developmental levels. Oh, and developmental you, levels. Yeah, you have a developmental level. And, and so certain clubs do that where they'll say, okay, your child came, we've evaluated. Okay, your child is not at a competitive level, but we have a developmental level for a program for your child. So we're going to put your child in that, in that. Now, sometimes it's a hard pill for some parents to swallow. I can though. imagine. Yeah, because you know some I parents think, think little Johnny is is the greatest. Oh, he's uh, going. He's going his way to the NBA. Oh, he's seven years old and he's already <laughs> going D one. You yeah. know, and and that's another dynamic that I, I we could probably have an hour show about uh -huh. in parents and and their their thought process and expectations of their child at seven, eight, nine, or ten. Mm -hmm. But when I was coaching track and field, we we didn't look at it. You know, track is a little different sport. And that's what I'm saying. Each sport, you have to kind of take a little different. Okay. We could take the little Johnny that had never run track. Doesn't you know? In track, you know, you run straight, turn left, and little Johnny doesn't know left from right. But we would take and develop. And I've had many of stories of kids that I was working with that may have been that below average or average child that came in at about nine or ten years old, but worked with them all the way up through it and. And I know of some of them that I've actually had the privilege of working with that went on to go to college and, mm -hmm. and compete at a collegiate level or, or were able to go to college and, right. and, and, and use that as a mechanism to get their degree. They weren't ever going to go to the highest level of sports, but it was a foundation that allowed that to, to be that student athlete. Yeah. Okay, now how do you deal with that? We talked yesterday, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the parents who their next kid is going to be LeBron James or everything, and you know that child is not going to be LeBron James. And in fact, you know the statistics of how many even high school basketball players are going to make it to the NBA. Yeah. I was fortunate as a kid because my dad told me, you better, you better hit the books because your chances of becoming a professional athlete are very <laughs> slim. Did it hurt my feelings? Yeah, but it was true. It was true. And so doesn't that fall on you uh, to, to kind of uh, push those kids also, get their lessons, read their books, do their homework? And, and it, because you're in sports. Yep. But you know darn well all those kids aren't going to make it. So how do you deal with that? So, you know, the hardest dynamic is dealing with the parents. <laughs> it's not the kids. Okay. If you tell little Johnny, you're not playing this week because you didn't pass your classes, well, Johnny's gonna go back and and go to go to work in the oh, classroom. Can you do that? I mean, you can. We have that. I mean, we don't govern it in the sense of AAU. We can't tell a program that they can't play a child because of grades. We're we're not a no pass no play. We're not the UIL. However, programs I know programs within my league within our uh, governance that implement that at the local club level. Okay. They have that right to implement that. But that's good, isn't it? Oh, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. The issue you run into is the parent that says, well, I paid X dollars for my child to play and he should play this week. And the program says, we have a policy that says we do progress checks of their grades and if right. they don't, uh, then he can't play until the second half or, or he only gets to do X this week. And some parents get upset because they're like, well, you don't understand. I'm trying to get my kid to the next level. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, okay, but remember, it's student athlete. 
the student comes before the athlete. Yeah. Okay. So as much yeah. as I'm a proponent of youth sports, as much as I'm a sports fan, as much as I want to see the next kid excel to the next level from a sports perspective, mm -hmm. you and I both know there have been tons of athletes that we have seen come through this community of San Antonio mm -hmm. who were phenomenal athletes. Right. And after high school, we never heard about them again. And why is that? Because they couldn't get it done in the classroom. They couldn't get it done in the They classroom. couldn't get it done uh, in the classroom. Yes. Okay. Uh, Rob, we'll take a break here. When we come back, I want to switch subjects just a little and talk about what's happening. You know, it's been getting a lot of publicity, Deion Sanders and the HBCUs. And if you can tell our viewers what's happening with all that, we'll be right back. We'll be right back with discussions with the writer Fred here at Black Media Video Network. 2021 is complete. Good or bad, you made it through. The year of many firsts. It will not be easily forgotten. The Black Book Yearbook will help you capsule the year that was 2021. Own, Own your, your part, part of, history. of history. Get your yearbook today at BlacksInSanAntonio.com. For the latest news and community activities, visit our companion site, BlackVideoNews.com, celebrating over 10 years of documenting the community. My Shiro doesn't always wear a cape, but she always has time for a hug, a smile, for going the extra mile. My Shiro stretches every dollar, puts in long hours, puts others first. But now it's your time, Mom. When you're ready to retire, we want you to be able to enjoy it. It's time to start saving now. A free three-minute online chat can give you the personalized tips you need to start boosting your retirement savings today. Visit aceyourretirement.org slash Shiro. Welcome back to Discussions with the Writer Fred right here at Black Video Network in San Antonio, Texas. And I'm so pleased to have as my guest, Mr. Rod Tanner. Uh, Rod, let's continue our discussion. And I said we're going to switch a little and talk about what's happening with the HBCUs and what Deion Sanders is trying to do. I don't, I don't think the major universities like that. Well, I don't know if they like it or not, but um, Dion moving to Jackson State University as a head coach, and uh, of course his son is a starting quarterback, um, and they uh, actually played for Florida A&M this past Saturday. Um, Florida A&M, of course, is dealing with some suspensions, so there's, their, their roster was limited. Um, so the, definitely a lopsided game, mm -hmm. but um, Jackson State University take nothing away from that game. They are a phenomenal team, but they've gotten a lot of, of good transfers in from some of the Power Fives. Oh, um, really? And Dion, everybody understands who Dion Sanders is. Yes. You know, he, everybody knows who he is. His his accomplishments in college and then in the pros, pros. and not only football, at, but baseball. And baseball too. Yes. Yeah. So, but Dion has is really up the game for the media. They, he's up the game for the those people watching that are on the watch list for the NFL to say, look, pay attention to the HBCUs. Mm -hmm. You know, they have phenomenal talent. But on top of that, he's telling a lot of athletes don't overlook coming to an HBCU. I think that's good. Yeah, you know, because you can still make it to the next level and play at an HBCU because there have been many that have done it. Doug Williams. Doug Williams. Yeah, Doug uh, Williams. Jerry Rice. Yeah. Uh, Michael Strahan. Right. Right up the road, Texas Southern University. Right. Who will be here next weekend, not the following weekend, playing UTSA. So Texas Southern, uh, Grambling, Bethune-Cookman, uh, Jackson State, Florida A&M, the list goes uh, on and on of right. those HBCUs. But, but the thing is, I think he's also trying to stress, you can get a quality education at an HBCU. Right, yeah. I mean, you gotta think about some of these universities have some of the best, best college programs, you know, the Thurgood Marshall School of Law is at Texas Southern University. Right, yeah, so definitely. So I, I think Dion's doing a good job in promoting that. Of course, there's, there's there's some debate on whether or not is it a fad. You know, what happens if Dion gets a better offer and leaves Jackson State University and goes on, which has already kind of been tossed out there on the table. Mm -hmm. um, you know what? That's just part of the dynamic we deal with in regards to uh, business because that's the other part that everybody must understand. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about college and sports, there's a business behind it, Absolutely. especially now with the NIL, you know, the name, image, and likeness mm -hmm. where – 
college athletes can actually get paid, paid. for yeah. their name, image, and likeness. There's a lot of dynamics that move around that. But even before that, college and universities were bringing in large amounts of money behind yeah. sports. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the dynamic you see out there. And Dion, with his name, has brought a lot of, 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 of eyes to, to, to this topic, HBCUs. to the HBCUs. Yeah. I always wondered, you know, way back when, all Catholic athletes would go to Notre Dame, and they just had a powerhouse in football, yes. like the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. What if all these great young high school players would go to, let's say they picked Jackson State? They'd be a powerhouse. Well, that's what's, I mean, they're picked, they won the, uh, the championship last year. They picked to win it again. Mm -hmm. um, they did get, their recruiting class this year is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say that there was a uh, either an Alabama transfer. There's been several <laughs> big transfers that have gone to Jackson State already. Um, well, I mean, and and, it, and with the trans, that's the other thing that's going on right now with the transfer portal changing and kids being able to transfer uh, f more more freely now. And so they still have to sit out a year. Or? No, they, not that. Depending on the dynamic, but pretty much not. Mm -hmm. um, for example, UTSA has two. Uh, uh, running back from yeah, L LSU. Yeah, that's right. From LSU, yeah. yeah. LSU. Uh, now, let's think about this. I grew up here in San Antonio. Uh -huh. Did you ever think you'd hear about an, a, an athlete of that caliber from LSU transferring to UTSA? No way. Yeah, the football but, team's only been there for, what, 12 years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that's what's happening now. The dynamic, the landscape is changing now. It's a different landscape now. How, how do you, how did he do that? Um, I got upset when they fired the black coach a few years back at UTSA. Then they brought this guy in, and he's done a phenomenal job. How, how, has, how has he managed to do that? I mean, they played Houston. In, in fact, they outplayed him. I think they had more yards and everything than Houston. Yeah. So I, how's, he, how's he able to do that in just a few years? Well, I mean, a lot of it is, you know, how you recruit. And then here's the thing that everybody knows, and it's, unfortunate statement to make but it is what it is you know winning solves a lot oh yeah <laughs> you win people notice you yeah and that's what happened you know you made a change UTSA made a change they started winning his recruiting efforts were were very good and here you go but okay you take Texas they did the same thing to the black coach Gave him a couple of years and boom he's gone mm -hmm. Texas A&M did the same thing mm -hmm. had a black coach boom he's gone UTSA did the same thing. I mean, what is, what's up with that? I mean, I, I know what you're saying, win, and you forget all that. But well, it, it's a reality. This happens to black coaches, and they don't get the same opportunity as the white coaches get. Well, um, that's a society thing. I think it has, you know, you can take it beyond sports. Um, oh, absolutely. We, we, we as a, a people have still um, been dealing with those things, and you know, there's a lot of uh, people that I talk to in, in my other profession, of course, as you know, I work in IT right. and work with an IT firm. And um, I am usually walking a room and I can go to a conference, which I'll be at a conference here in a couple of weeks in Austin at an IT conference. And I'm, I won't be surprised to sit in a room in some of the breakout sessions and of 30 people, uh, there may be me and one other of color in the room. In there? Yeah. We, we still, as a, as, as a society, as a nation, are still dealing with those things that have happened back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. There's a lot of people that want to believe that it's over, but it's not. Yeah, it's not. We we are still dealing with some things, and and I talk about this in other discussions. Uh, things that happened um, to us as a people in this country from even the 20s and 30s. We're still yeah. dealing with it, and and it's just the dynamic, and we keep striving and pushing. So what you're talking about that happened with these black coaches, what, why there's still not that many coaches of, of color or black coaches and why they at don't the give, highest level. Right. Why they don't give the black coaches the same chance or opportunity that they give the white coaches? I mean, give them two years, boom, they're gone. Well, it's the same thing we can say about a lot of, again, why, why, do, why do these things happen in all aspects of, of right. life and business? Okay. You know, because you're, there, there's a money driver behind it all. Money drives everything. You know? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I don't, I mean every, it's the one conversation a lot of people don't want to have, but it's yeah. the facts. Yeah. Money drives everything. Absolutely. And, and if, the, 
if the boosters don't like it, yeah. and they're the ones throwing the money. And that's Texas. Well, that's, that's anywhere. Texas. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to disagree with you. That's okay. anywhere. Yeah, but I, yeah, okay. Hey, boost, boosters, hey, I'm sorry. That's my opinion, at least. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to take another break, but when we come back, I want to talk about this whole issue of the GOAT. They're making this person the GOAT in this sport, this person the GOAT in this sport. And I'm, I'm thinking about, well, you know, what about 20 years ago when somebody else would have been the GOAT? How do we really, how do we really uh, decide who is, or should we decide who is the greatest of all time? We'll be right back with discussions with the writer Fred. Veterans, when you're struggling, soon becomes later, becomes someday, becomes when. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. Hello, this is Cornell with Frost Bank. Hi there, this is Terry with Frost. Good evening, this is Franklin. This is Robert with Frost. Hello, this is Rosemary with Frost Bank. Welcome back to Discussions with the Writer Fred, right here at Black Video News in San Antonio, Texas, the voice for the black community. And I'm here with Mr. Rod Tanner. Rod, let's change the subject again. And last week we watched one of the greatest tennis players ever. Uh, she made three rounds and then she lost. And that's Serena Williams. And I'm glad to say she has a Williams name and lived a while in the city that I'm from, Saginaw, <laughs> Michigan. So, but then they moved to Compton. But they talk about Michael Jordan's the gold, um, uh, LeBron James is the gold, and and uh, she's now the gold in in in, um, in tennis. And and uh, then they talk about golf and all this. What what's up with this gold thing? What's, <laughs> what's up with the greatest of all times? Yeah. Well, you know, in boxing, there's only one goat, right? Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Ali. Yeah. Well. But, but there, there will be debates, or was it Mike Tyson? Or you know, Joe Lewis. Uh, or Joe Lewis, yeah. See, so and it's think, a time thing, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's a time thing. I think you'll always have that discussion. And then when you, when you try to actually line it up and say, okay, who is the greatest of all time in any particular sport? Right. It becomes a very difficult conversation. Because, yeah. I mean, now, Tiger Woods. Okay. He definitely is 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 the goat of golf, but but people well, well, project wait, wait, Jack wait, wait, Nicholas. Wait, wait. Yeah, I should get Jack so, Nicholas. No, no, trust okay. me, trust me. <laughs> uh, 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 see, uh, the debate can go on. Yeah, there, there's you know this this ongoing debate. I'll be honest with you. I actually find it fun and I love it. Okay, I love the fact that we go through this because uh, guess what? There's another goat out there in the pasture right now, <laughs> getting ready, getting ready, getting ready. Just a little billy goat right yeah. now. Yeah. This yeah, little billy goat, goat right now. Right, that yeah. little billy goat at some point is going to be a goat. <laughs> and, and, and you'll see this happen. Um, I, you know, talk about track and field a little bit. Okay. You know, Michael Johnson, Usain Bolt, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Jackie Joyner Kersey, mm -hmm. um, Wilma Rudolph. You're right. Oh, whoa, whoa, I threw one at you there, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Jesse Owens. Jesse Owens. Yeah, I mean, yeah see, you see? Yeah, see, yeah, now yeah. we can go, we can go, but, but I got a goat brewing right here in, in Temple, Texas. I got a 14-year-old kid that just went to the Junior Olympics, won the 100, 200, and long jump, broke three national records. Really? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, Kendrick Jones Jr. is his name. Uh -huh. He's a goat in the making. Okay. You know, so I, yeah, so it's, it's a lot of that, that goat conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but when you talk about that, it's, it's a very difficult conversation because here's the thing we have to look at. The, the dynamic of the time frame when... You look at, for example, let's take uh, Walter Payton. Okay. And great, great, great athlete. Yeah. Uh, when he was playing football, and you look at the rules of the game, uh, uh, Jerry Rice. Okay. Jerry Rice, phenomenal receiver, but at the time Jerry Rice was playing, I mean, they literally let you take the receiver's head off. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you, yeah. you, you can't barely touch a receiver now. I know. Yeah. You, you know, quarterbacks, the same thing. They, yeah. they were just the mutilating, 
the, the, the players on the field. Yeah. Now you touch them and it's, it's a, you, you eject it from the game. And you know that's a good point because I watch football and I see these little wide receivers going over the middle now. Back in the day, there's no way in the world. You couldn't have done it. You, yeah, you got clobbered. Yeah, you got it. So, so that's another thing. And then the dynamic of, let's, you know, the one that everybody hates to talk about is basketball. Okay. So, you know, when we talk about the goats of basketball, there's a lot of names that come up, and there's the debate. Jordan, Kobe, LeBron. We forget about um, Ferdinand, Lou Alcindor, Jr., Mm. Uh, for those who don't know, that's, that's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people don't know his real name. Mm. You know, six NBA titles and multiple MVPs. But right. when you look at the, the, how the game was when he was playing uh -huh. and what he had to go through just to be on the court yeah, and yeah. then still accomplish what he accomplished. It's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And then you look at even when Jordan was playing mm -hmm. and, and versus Le LeBron and and. What, what they call a foul today, what they call, what, what they call a foul today uh -huh. was not even called back in, in when Jordan was in the game, when, when, when Kareem was in the game. So, you know, there's that different dynamic of the game and mm -hmm. how the game is played now. But these are still great athletes. These are still, they are the greatest of, uh, of their time. Of their time. I think yeah. that's the way it should be. And put. maybe that's better, a better, better way, way to say it. Who is yeah. the greatest of their time? Yeah. But you'll always have those true sports fans and true sports pundits that will say, nope, nope, nope. Yeah, I don't care what you say. You know, um, uh, the Spurs did what they did, and, you know, and the Admiral did what he did, and, mm -hmm. And so George, forth. you did what he did. Yeah, you know, nice Gervin, Gervin did yeah. what he did. Uh, no, no, no. But this is the greatest of all times. So you'll always have that debate in every sport. Yeah. And the problem is when you talk about Kareem uh, or Bill Russell, what he did in the 60s, a lot of these people don't, they weren't even born. Yeah. So they don't know what his accomplishments yeah, were. Yeah, I, I was an infant when he yeah. was born. <laughs> so yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah, but I mean, I know, I know the history and uh -huh. what he accomplished. And again, thinking about that, when Bill Russell was playing again, you know, in the 60s, what was going on with segregation in the 60s? Yeah, the, the, the middle of it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh -huh. so you got to think about those dynamics. Uh -huh. And a lot of times in the sports world, they don't want to wrap that in. They don't want to talk about that. They don't want to bring that into the equation. Uh -huh. I think you got to bring it but into the equation. But it's there. I think you have to bring it into the equation because it's, it's, it's reality. Yeah. You know, not wanting to truly, truly teach the history, hmm, got a problem with that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I want to talk about one more uh, subject, and that is baseball. Mm -hmm. We've kind of disappeared uh, from the sport at a professional level. Back in, in the 50s and the 60s, you had Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, you know, Jackie Robinson, and that was the sport that we were most dominant in. Now it's football and especially basketball. So what happened to us in the sport of baseball? Well, I, I think a lot of it stems around the, the growth of baseball um, globally. Because you look at the Asian influence, you look, well, the Latin influence has been coming along for some time. Yeah. Huge Latin influence, huge Asian, Asian influence in the game. And then locally within the U.S., um, the cost to develop young athletes is, is become pretty expensive because um, not that I'm necessarily a fan of it, but it is what it is there's a lot of year-round baseball for youth. And in order to play year-round baseball, you have to have the economics to support it. Yeah. And, and you're playing travel ball. Travel ball, travel ball is expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're in a situation where economically you can't afford that, you're not in the travel ball, which means your development into the next level at high school and college, there's, there's less and less of those people who can't afford it which means that the numbers you have of people of color or black, black, black players is not as prevalent. Mm -hmm. But it's there, but it's not as prevalent as it was. And of course, the, the names that you're bringing up, even at that point, we're still playing catch up. Because you, know, you gotta think it was um, you know, when uh, Jackie Robinson came in, right. you know, the, the Major League Baseball had been going on for some time. A long time, and, yeah. And so there's still a catch up. You know, you, so then when you take the, the development of baseball globally and how it is, mm -hmm. 
you, you're playing catch up, plus there's other in, in influences that are coming in, mm -hmm. and then you look at the development of it and the cost to develop athletes. You know, so it's a different dynamic to keep um, that in, and especially there's still that inner city um, growth that you're trying to do, but can that, that child that's in the inner city who may not have the economic um, support, can they still get it done? And it's easier to play basketball in the city because the basketball racks are right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, a little different dynamic when yeah. it comes to, to those types of sport. Mm. Yeah. Well, Rod, what would you say, in wrapping up, what would you say to the parents out there uh, in terms of putting so much emphasis on sports and not, I mean, they want to see their kid on the basketball court, not in the library. Well, How do you respond to that? You know, and it's, it's, it's an uh, unfortunate thing that, that we get caught up in this mainstream, but parents have to go back to the basics and make sure they focus on the academics and get, get that foundation because you may have that child that could excel at the next level and they don't because they couldn't get it done in the classroom. Right. Um, you know, the other topic is uh, how over the top parents have become in, in this dynamic there, you may be aware there was a situation up in Dallas at a youth football game where a coach was shot and, and really? killed. Um, and this just was not but three or four weeks ago. And it just is, the it got- The coach was shot and killed? Yes, and it, it was an unfortunate situation between two, two people. And it was just over the top because of a game and a call by a referee. And, and we, we have got to bring this down to another level of what are we really doing? Why are we here? You know, what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to develop these young people to be productive citizens in society first. Yes. yes. That's the first thing. Yes, the, absolutely. You know, the, getting it done from an academic and developing, developmental, uh, developing them mentally, get that out, and then, then we work on the sports aspect of, of, the, of the child because sports initially was a way to, to have something extracurricular in a sense, but now it seems that Dominic, parents, uh, that, that's the forefront, yeah. and, it, and you can't make it the forefront. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. very good, yeah. Well, we're gonna wrap up. Uh, any final words you wanna get from our viewers out there? Well, just, you know, I, I'm excited to be a part of the show. I really okay. appreciate, you know, you having me on. Um, hopefully we can do this again sometime soon. We will, soon. for sure. All right. We will. Well, thank you for coming in, Rod, I appreciate it. This is Fred Williams' discussion with the writer Fred telling our story our way. <laughs>